Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us for our latest uh, food workshop. We are thrilled that you could uh, join us on this really beautiful um, Tuesday evening. We're here, I'm here in San Francisco on campus. Actually, it's a pretty nice day. Uh, we always like to know where you're all joining us from too. If you wanna put that in the chat, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, my name is Nicole Lang. I uh, work here in alumni relations and in university engagement, and I am a fellow alum from the class of 1993. So I'm, I'm checking these out. Las Vegas, Nevada is the furthest so far. Whittier, we've got some in Pacifica. Okay, <laughs> Tracy, my hometown, actually. So welcome there. Um, so before we get started, first of all, we're going to appreciate you putting any questions you have as we're watching today's presentation in the Q&A, and we'll keep up to date um, on those and ask um, Chef Tim as we go along. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to let you know some um, fun things that are going on around campus, um, not the least of which is that just a few weeks ago, we held our 122nd commencement ceremony where we celebrated over 7,000, well over 7,000 new graduates at our annual ceremony at Oracle Park. There, our alum Ben Fong Torres, who graduated with the class in the class of 1966 and went on to have a prolific career in media, starting as a journalist for Rolling Stone magazine, was honored with an honorary doctorate degree. Um, activist, filmmaker, and psychotherapist Satsuki Ina was also honored with an honorary degree. Her family was forced into a concentration camp for Japanese Americans during World War II. Much of her work as an adult has centered around helping people heal from similar trauma. Um, we were also honored to have alumna Jayshri Yulal, the CEO and president of Arista Networks, deliver the keynote address. She graduated from SF State in 1981 and has been named one of the top leaders in tech by Forbes and Barron's. Um, on campus, we have some exciting news. In April, the university celebrated the construction, the start of construction for the West Campus Green project, which includes a first year residence hall that will add 750 new beds uh, for students, a dining facility, and a student health center. The six story first year residence hall is slated for occupancy in the fall of 2024. And the dining common area in the Gator Health Center will open in the winter of 2024. We also have some new leadership on campus. Grace Yu is, has been named the next Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies. She is a professor of Asian American Studies at SF State and has worked in higher education for over 30 years. 27 of which right here at SF State. She began as an Asian American Studies lecturer faculty member in 1996 and 18 years later became chair of that same department. Um, Ifoma Nkwanwo has been appointed Dean of the College of Liberal and Creative Arts at SF State um, beginning August 15th. She is currently the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Sarah Lawrence College. Before that, she served as the Associate Professor of English at Vanderbilt University, where she was also an affiliate in the Latinx Studies Program, Center for Latin American Studies, and Center for Medicine, Health, and Society. After serving as Dean of the College of Health and Social Sciences since 2014, Alvin Alvarez has announced he's gonna return to um, teaching this summer. So Professor of Sociology, Adriana, Adriana Clay will be the interim Dean starting in July. Clay has a PhD in Sociology from UC Davis, an MA from the University of Memphis and a BA in Political Science in Women's Studies from the University of Missouri, Columbia. She has been at SF State since 2004, and she is the author of The Hip Hop Generation Fights Back, Youth, Activism, and the Post-Civil Rights po Politics. And we also have some exciting student news and university achievements to report. 
this is really exciting. Let me know if anyone else, if anyone on uh, tonight's call or Zoom has, was in the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps recently recognized SF State as number 20 on its list of all time top volunteer producing colleges and universities. The ranking is based on an annual list issued by the Peace Corps between 2003 and 2023. The Wall Street Journal lists SF State as the number five public college nationwide for accounting salaries of graduates. They analyze data and pay data from Lightcast and Glassdoor, and the ranking finds that SF State bachelor's degree recipients um, earn over 12% 12, 12 more than the median in their first 10 years. A member of SF State's forensics team made school history with several top honors at a national tournament, including an All-American Award. Kivraj Singh, SF State's sole representative at the, American, at the American Forensics Association National Speech Tournament, earned third place nationwide in after-dinner speaking among 126 competitors, including Ivy League schools. In addition, Kivraj was named an All-American and an Oral Interpretation semi-finalist. And lastly, we're gonna have some fun things coming up um, uh, for our alum and around campus, SF State. We're gonna be hosting a booth at the SF Pride Fest on June 24th and 25th at the Civic Center from noon to 6 p.m. So come on by and support our LGBTQ community and pick up some SF State, upside down, SF State uh, uh, Pride themed swag while we're there and our, uh, one of our esteemed alums, Boots Riley, has a new series called I Am a Virgo, which is going to be debuting on Amazon Prime on June 23rd. This series is an absurdist coming of age tale about a 13 foot tall young black man's odyssey in Oakland. SF State faculty have organized a screening at the Roxy tomorrow. Uh, it's sold out. We wanted to be able to put the link in, but it's already sold out. But what we're going to put in the chat instead is a link so that you can watch the trailer. It looks fantastic. So make sure you check that out. Um, get on Prime. <laughs> and we have a date for our annual Alumni Hall of Fame celebration that's going to be held on November 3rd. Um, and we're going back to the Ritz-Carlton San Francisco. We're very much looking forward to um, announcing the 2023 inductees soon. And now, really, what you're all here for is that I get the privilege of introducing tonight's presenter, Chef Tim Shaw is the chef instructor at SF State's Vista Room. <clears throat> the, the Vista Room is a fully functional restaurant on campus that serves as a classroom for SF State students to gain restaurant work experience. Chef Tim's educational background is extensive. He's a graduate of, here we go, here's the list, the French Culinary Institute, Williams College with a degree in classics and archeology, span New York University with a master's in food studies and the Presidio Graduate School with a master's of public administration and sustainable management where he focused on food policy and did his capstone presentation on the issue of GMOs. He has designed a program in nutrition and sustainability for the French Culinary Institute in 2007 and was the keynote speaker at Yale Medical School's week long module on nutrition in 2009. His work in sustainability led him to the Campbell, California campus of the French Culinary Institute, where he helped design and implement a week-long farm-to-table field trip for the students. The trip was featured in an article in Edible Silicon Valley in 2013. Tim joined SF State in 2015 and has become a great supporter of the Alumni Association. Tim has contributed many recipes for our Gator Bites series and has hosted several foodie workshops for us, most uh, uh, including last summer's red, white, and barbecue summer workshop, where he taught us how to make a very, very tasty mango salsa, along with grilled fish and nopales cactus and chayote squash. Um, Chef Tim is a survivor of stage four non-Hodgkin's 
lymphoma and was involved in fundraising for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of San Francisco, where he was a candidate for the 2014 Man of the Year. Chef Tim, it is such an honor to get to work with you, and I am very thrilled to introduce you to our uh, uh, guest tonight. I'm going to let him take over and show us how to make very delicious chicken wings and strawberry shortcake. Welcome, Chef Tim. Well, thank you. That's a very humbling um, <laughs> introduction. Uh, um, thank you for all that. And thank you all for uh, coming here. I will start by saying I'm a little discombobulated. Uh, my husband got uh, is a dog walker and got bit by a dog today. So I spent most of the morning and afternoon in the emergency room with him. He's fine. Uh, he's upstairs sleeping, but he usually is my cameraman and helps me like move the, the computer around. But I'm kind of on my own tonight. So hopefully I, I've been practicing to see what the angles I need to get. And uh, and I, I think it'll uh, I think it'll work. So um, again, welcome and thank you for all uh, 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 joining here. Um, if you've been to um, one of these demonstrations that I, I like to do, um, I really like to stress that when I'm uh, teaching, and even when I'm teaching in the classroom, I like to focus on technique rather than recipe. Uh, if you Google chicken wing recipe, 75 million recipes come up. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is the best recipe you're ever gonna have or, or whatever. Um, what I would like to show you is, is a technique that helps um, uh, kind of build up the flavors and helps the chicken wings uh, cook properly because chicken wings are, you know, they're kind of the, the forearm of the chicken and they've got a lot of tendons and cartilaginous material that needs to be broken down um, over time. Yes, thank you, Grant. He's, I, I think he's fine. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a hazard of the, a hazard of the, 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 of his job. Um, but uh, uh, the, the technique I'm going to show you is to how to slowly cook um, chicken wings in the oven at a lower temperature um, than if we were just going to throw them on a grill or if we were going to um, sort of air fry them or something. And there's a lot of different ways that you can cook uh, chicken wings. I like this way because um, it builds up. Um, it's kind of like lacquering a, a Peking duck or basting a turkey. And what we're going to do is I, I have my um I have my chicken wings that have been marinating in the sauce. And I, I use the recipe I gave you for the sauce. But if you're cooking for yourself, again, you can use whatever sauce you want for this, whether it's a teriyaki sauce or, or Frank's red hot sauce or, or a, a sweet and sour or just raised barbecue. It's, you're going to get the same results. Um, but this this technique is going to be uh, uh let me take these out i'm gonna get rid of the spoon um i have a little roasting pan here let me put that there i think that's a good angle you won't see my face but that's okay i'm gonna spritz it a little bit just because there's a lot of sugar in this sauce um the recipe for the sauce that i sent has it's got brown sugar which is sugar it's got ketchup which Face it is sugar. Uh, it's got a little acidity and it's from the tomatoes and 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 stuff. A um, little soy sauce for the saltiness and the umaminess. Um, it calls for some vinegar. I just use some basic rice wine vinegar. You could use a red vinegar or wine vinegar. Again, the vinegar just adds acidity. Um, and which which uh, ever vinegar you like. Uh, uh, is is sort of up to your own taste. But what we've got is we've got some acid, we've got some umami from the soy sauce, we've got some, and, and the ketchup actually, tomatoes have a lot of that, and then uh, uh, some acid. So it's acid, sugar, salt, um, that all kind of builds up. And what I want to do, because these take a good half hour to cook, which is, you'd think it wouldn't take so long since they're so small, um, but the technique of cooking this way is I'm going to lay them out individually, and what I'm going to do is pop them in the oven. I have my oven set at 325, uh, a, a relatively low temperature. Because of all the sugar in this sauce, I don't want it to burn. Um, but what's going to happen is the heat is going to cause the sugars to start to caramelize, which is going to build up a depth of flavor. After 10 minutes, I'm going to pick them out. I'm going to flip them over. I'm going to baste them with some more sauce and then pop them back in the oven. And then the, the technique of this style of cooking the chicken wings, rather again than just um, uh, uh, white wine would work. Yes, I mean, because vinegar is just 
wine that has gone bad, uh, but you want a little bit of acidity to cut the sweetness. So if you don't have any vinegar, maybe lemon juice would actually be better than, um, than a wine because wine is acidic, but it's not as acidic as vinegar. But taste it. Again, again, try it, taste it and see if that tastes okay on, on your palate. But a, a wine could work as well. Um, but what's going to happen is they're going to get some nice caramelization on the color uh, on, the, uh, on the top. I'm going to flip them over, brush them with more sauce. Put them back in the oven and it's that brushing and flipping and brushing and flipping that builds up a layer of nice gooey sweet caramelized sugar from the sauces um that's that's going to complement kind of the the nice texture of, of of the meat as it starts to break down so i've got these they look nice I'm gonna pop them in the oven I'm gonna set my timer for 10 minutes the wings are ready to go. Um, I will show you that I do have, I saved some of the sauce on the side that I'm going to serve on my plate with it um, because I don't want to use the stuff that the chicken has been marinating in because that has raw chicken in it. Uh, and that's not, not something you want to eat. Um, this would absolutely work with drumsticks. And this entire technique of the brushing and the cooking, the brushing, the cooking, is used in what's called um, in Hawaiian cooking, it's called huli huli chicken, which means turn, turn. So you do that on a grill where you would take like the thighs or the drumsticks and you again, brush it with the sauce, let it cook on the grill a little bit, flip it over, brush it, flip it over, brush it, flip it over, brush it. And that's gonna build up a really, really nice layer of, 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 of caramelization and flavor and depth of flavor. The, uh, uh, what you have to be careful with that though, is on the grill because there's so much sugar in the ketchup and in the brown sugar and all that, um, it, it can actually burn because grills are, you know, a grill can be five or 600 degrees as opposed to the oven, which is, um, which is 300 and, 25. Uh, so that's the technique of the of the of the chickens. Again, the sauce, use whatever sauce you want. It's that turning and basting and turning and basting that builds up the um uh, uh, the, the, the the depth of the flavor. Now we're going to start on our biscuits. And uh, again, if you Google strawberry shortcake recipes, you'll come up with about 13 million. Uh, so this is a very specific style of strawberry shortcake that actually uses, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a drop biscuit. So the technique that I'm going to show you is how to make a biscuit uh, that's just kind of dropped out onto, the, um, uh, onto the, the baking sheet rather than rolling out and cutting into circles or whatever, which is perfectly acceptable. Again, you can, you can make strawberry shortcake with a uh, uh, with a sheet cake or with a white cake or a yellow cake or whatever. There's no rules in terms of what you can do. But the technique that I like to do um, is this drop biscuit style of, of, of shortcake. Because if you, if you learn this technique, this is also the technique that you would use if you wanted to do it savory and make biscuits for maybe sausage and biscuits or biscuits that go on top of chicken and dumplings. It's the same technique of working with the flour and working with the butter and, and, and all of that. Um, so this, let me get the, I miss my, I miss my cameraman. <laughs> uh, so the trick of this and the technique that I'm going to show you is um, when you're making biscuits, the, what you want to do is, um, as opposed to if you're making bread or if you're making pasta, where you want to get some liquid into flour, um, and I'm using wheat flour, it's just all purpose flour. Uh, you could use pastry flour if you wanted, it would be lighter. Um, by adding in the butter, which is fat, and then adding in, I actually use some buttermilk. The recipe said you could use milk or cream or half and half or buttermilk. I'm using buttermilk solely because I had some in my fridge and I'm heading to my father's in uh, in Connecticut tomorrow. And if I come back in a month, in a, in a month the buttermilk will have gone bad. So I'm using the buttermilk, uh, uh, but but milk and cream work as well. Um, but the technique I'm going to show you is, is when you're making biscuits for sausage and biscuits or for this or for, again, um, chicken and dumplings, something like that. What you want to do is you want to, is you want to, work your dough, but not create too much gluten. 
Um, if you were, I, I think I did, we did pasta a couple of years ago for, for the alumni association. I showed everybody how to make hand rolled pasta. And when you make hand rolled pasta, make your dough and then you knead it and you knead it and you knead it for a good 10 minutes or so. And that actually encourages the gluten development, which gives you that tooth, that texture that you want with, um, with pasta. With a biscuit, you want it to be light and fluffy and almost kind of feathery and fall apart in your mouth. And the way you get that is by discouraging gluten development. And gluten is a protein that's found in wheat and rye and barley. Um, and, and it's something that bakers use when they want to create structure in a baguette, or it's something that you don't want to use if you want to create the nice crumbly texture of a biscuit or a sugar cookie or, or something like that. And the way that you create gluten or encourage gluten development, because you're not really creating it, it's there, um, is by adding liquid and then by doing that manual sort of manipulation that you do with kneading, K-N-E-A-D, not N-E-E-D. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I have my flour and this is the flour and the baking powder and a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. If you don't have a sifter, because most people don't have sifters, all you need to do is kind of mix it all together because what we want is the sugar and the salt and the baking soda or baking powder to be equally or evenly distributed. And then I have my butter that was actually in the freezer. So this is butter that's cut really small and is nice and cold because one of the things that encourages gluten development is heat. So like if you make bread, you're gonna use water that's maybe body temperature, 98, 99 degrees. Since I want to discourage gluten development, I'm going to use butter that's actually, it's, it's been in the freezer. And what I'm going to do, let's get a better angle here. Maybe if I even put this underneath, I'll put this underneath. There we go, I think that works. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the butter into the flour utilizing my hands. And what I'm doing to kind of show you is I'm picking it up and I'm just pinching, I'm pinching the butter and the flour together. If you see a recipe and it says like, cut the butter into the flour, this is what it means, is it means you're, I'm kind of taking the flour and squeezing the butter and the flour together so that the flour becomes kind of coated with the butter and the butter sort of not dissolves, that's not the right word I wanna use because that implies that it's melted, but, the, but they incorporate together without sort of becoming homogenized, I guess is the best way to put it. I saw a question come in. Can you send the recipes separately? Um, yes, I believe that they were, uh, uh, they should have been in the invitation, but absolutely email me. My email is chef Tim. Uh, at sfsu.edu, and I can get you to that, that for sure. Um, so what I'm doing, and you can use your hands, or if you have a pastry cutter, which looks like, I don't even have one here because I always use my hands, um, you could use that as well. But the point is, I want to do this quick, and I want to work fast so that the butter doesn't melt. This is tricky to do, and it's kind of funny, and it's one of those sort of ironies that like the best biscuits are made in the South in like Southern cooking, and then the South, it's often very, very hot and humid, um, but somehow they've figured out a way to make really great biscuits. It's easy to do when it's colder out, but then again, I'm from New England, so maybe I'm just used to being cold. That's why I live in Pacifica, 60 degrees is my happy place. So what I'm doing again, I'm just kind of pinching, pinching and squeezing, pinching and squeezing until the flour starts to look like maybe some really finely grated Parmesan cheese or some sort of wet sand. You don't want it to be completely homogenized and that the butter is totally mixed in. Sometimes people ask, can you do this in a food processor? And, and you can, but you have to be really careful because the speed of the food processor, like a, uh, you know, like a, a Cuisinart, can heat up and actually melt the butter, and then it becomes more incorporated than you want. Because if you've ever made anything like, like, um, like pancakes, you don't want your, your batter to be completely homogeneous because uh, then it, it, comes out, it comes out too tough. And what I'm, I'm trying to do, and I'll show you physically because I think it's getting to where it looks really good. 
is if you see the this, it kind of looks, the, the flowers turned a little yellow from the butter, but there's still kind of little chunks. Some of them are a little bigger than I want, but they're, they're okay. Um, the point being, you don't want it to be completely uniform. You want those little pieces of butter, smaller, let's say maybe like the size of a lentil, because when this heats up in the oven, that butter is going to melt and that's what's going to give you that nice soft biscuity texture. So these taste like a biscuit and feel like a biscuit rather than feel like a, a baguette or crunchy like a piece of bread. So I think- Hey Tim, we had a couple of questions. Are there any um, substitutes for butter? And someone was asking um, that they were assuming this was unsalted butter that you're using. Yes, yes, absolutely. I uh, uh, In baking, um, well, I mean, I would say that that's kind of up to your personal preference. I like to use unsalted butter because I've added a little salt in there. One second, because I want to show you how we're going to baste our chicken. <laughs> oh, that looks nice. Let me get a something to put it on the ground or on here. Okay, so taking a little break from the shortbread, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the chicken over. And then I'm going to use my little brush and I'm going to baste it with another layer of the sauce. That's smelling good. Bump, bump, bump. We did this in the Vista room where we'd do maybe 150 of these in the morning. And it was uh, a little time consuming flipping over 150. So they've been basted. They've gotten a little more sauce. Gonna pop them back in the oven for another 10 minutes. Okay, so the questions were, uh, a substitute for butter? Yes. Um, what the butter does, butter is a fat, and a fat helps, helps um, all fats have a shortening effect on gluten. You've, you've probably heard the term vegetable shortening, which is kind of the commercial term for like Crisco. Um, I'm sorry, there's this one little spotlight coming down from my track light above my head. Very um, heavenly. That's what we okay. just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but all fats inhibit gluten development. So the higher the percentage of fat in a baked good, the more delicate the baked good is going to be. Think of like a croissant. I mean, a croissant basically has the same ingredients as a baguette, but a baguette, you know, that can be crunchy and could rip the roof of your mouth. It's so crunchy. But if you put in like half or 60 or 70% of the weight of the flour as fat in, in a on as butter, um, that gives you a completely different texture. And that's the nature of the fat. What you would want to do here, if you don't eat butter, um, you certainly could use uh, like a margarine or, or, or a vegan butter. The point being, you want it to be solid. So you want to use like a solid butter from the fridge rather than something like olive oil, which you can use to make baked goods. But because it's liquid, it doesn't have that, it doesn't have that, um, that property that where it that it's in the dough as kind of a solid and then when it cooks it sort of melts its way out and adds to the texture so if you want to substitute the butter it's better to use a solid refrigerated fat than just like vegetable oil which you could do but then you're going to have more of it's going to be more of a cake texture rather than a biscuit texture did that help uh is it okay to add milk instead of butter no, because I'm going to add the milk now. Um, because again, the butter is um, the butter is the it's the fat component, and it's the sort of the solid fat component. Let me turn this down so you can see it. There we go. It's the solid fat component. But what I'm going to do now is add in my liquid ingredient, which again, in this case, could be milk, could be cream, or I have buttermilk. So I'm going to add in the buttermilk. As you're doing that, we had a couple of questions about the wings, if we can, as you're mixing there. Um, were those wings skinless? 
And I don't think you can, I don't, I've never seen skinless wings, okay. <laughs> you see skinless breasts and skinless thighs, but I think that would be really tricky to remove the skin from a wing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you've seen them, um, I, I, I guess you can, but I've honestly, I've never seen skinless wings. Okay. And then um, someone was asking the, for the, the brush you're using, can you use the same brush that was used on the raw chicken? Can you continue to use the same brush as your um, basting? I didn't yeah. use it. I didn't baste the chicken on the raw chicken. I the the chicken came right from this, ah, and then okay. I'm basting it with this. So I didn't Got use it. this on the raw chicken. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And it's, this is uh these are great to have. This is a silicone uh, brush, so it, it's very easily it's more sanitizable than like the actual brushes that you would like paint for. Um, how much milk is for the biscuits? I I'm doing a half a recipe here, and it was a half a cup of buttermilk. The uh, uh, the cream is totally separate. The cream is just whipped cream and it's a garnish. So that you make however much you want. Um, depends on how much you want whipped cream on your on your uh, on your finished biscuit. And I'll show you that um, when we're done. Any other questions that I miss? I take a little sip. Of I think we're all, I think we're all caught up there. We're all caught up. So it's a uh, yes. If it was a double, if it was a double recipe. It would. I mean, if it was a full recipe, it would have been a full cup of liquid either milk, cream, or buttermilk. I'm doing a half recipe, so this is a half a cup of the, of the buttermilk. Excellent. All right, so what I'm gonna do here, and this is the trick part, is since I went out of my way to work with some nice cold butter and to really like not work it enough so that I work up gluten, I'm going to take, I've added in my buttermilk, I'm going to take a spatula, and I'm just going to kind of fold it in. I'm not going to really stir it. I don't want to agitate it too much because, again, it's that agitation. It's the moving around, the stirring it that actually starts to build up the gluten. And that's what I don't want to have a nice biscuit texture. So once it sort of incorporates and kind of looks like this, the term you'll hear in regards to biscuits is that the batter should be shaggy, um, which doesn't mean hairy like a dog but it shouldn't it shouldn't look like nice and it shouldn't look like a, a crepe batter or like a a smoothie or or even even um even uh, uh uh a cake batter which you know you could probably pour out it looks it looks kind of rough there's still little pieces of butter that are in there but that's what we want because when this cooks again the baking soda, the baking powder is going to cause it to rise. The buttermilk, which has a little acidity in it, is going to help encourage that rising. And then the um, uh, uh, the butter actually melts and sets the gluten. So the drop biscuit part comes from this little technique I'm going to do now. And you notice I sprayed my chicken with a little bit of Pam so that they don't stick. I don't need to do this with this because there's so much butter in the dough that I'm not really worried about these sticking to the um to the uh to the tin foil. So all I'm gonna do take out a nice that looks like a nice size to me. I think I got I got four I can get four out of this half. And again this comes down to the technique. If you were serving this and you wanted to serve it into slices, you could easily just put this whole thing in the on a mound and let it bake but I want to do this kind of individually. So again, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to work it as little as possible. They're not pretty, but they're not supposed to be. They're going to be delicious. And I just kind of flatten them out and they look like that. They look, they look kind of messy, but that's sort of the beauty of this style of making a biscuit. I, uh, I will say, if you do want it to make them more uniform, you could take this dough and roll it out with a rolling pin and then use a circle and cut them. But the more you work it and rolling them out is going to work the gluten, the, the tougher the biscuit is going to be. So the reason why I like doing it this way is this is going to be um, really, really nice and delicate biscuit. Did I see a question come in? I'm looking at the recipe and the biscuits recipe said it doesn't have the milk listed. That's interesting. I just saw the recipe. Uh, I used a half a cup of buttermilk. 
Yes, you can use a silicone sheet. I didn't use a silicone sheet because I'm assuming most people don't have them uh, in their um, in their in their uh, uh, kitchen. I would recommend not using silicone sheets for the chicken wings because that sauce is going to start to get to the bottom it's, and it's going to be a real, real pain in the butt to, to clean. They are non-stick. They're really great for baking stuff, but with the chicken wings, they get really, really dirty. You can try it, but it's going to get really, really dirty. Uh, I don't understand veggies recommended. Um, I don't use palm oil, but if you wanted to use palm oil, it's a solid oil. You could use that. Yes. Do, 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 do. I'm interesting that the recipe didn't have the milk in there because uh, I'll have to look at that. I, I just saw the recipe and I thought it did. We can, oh. uh, we'll, we'll, any modifications when we send that out, we'll make sure that that, no the, 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 the milk uh, measurement is listed. Okay. And then uh, I think uh, Lawrence had asked a little bit earlier what he meant with the veggies were, if there are veggies to serve with the chicken wings. Um, oh, that's know, totally up to having you. Having some some semblance of healthiness along with your chicken wings, what vegetable would you? <laughs> you could you could serve whatever you wanted with them. Uh, traditionally, chicken wings like buffalo wings are usually served with sliced celery. So I have some sliced celery that I'm going to uh, uh, serve on the side of that. But in terms, I mean, uh, vegetables on the side of a dish that's a garnish. So you could do that yourself. I wish we had time to show you how to do the cauliflower because uh, we do. Um, in the Vista room, we do a, it's a vegan version of chicken wings where you take cauliflower and you toss them with rice flour and bake them and then do hot sauce and they're delicious. Not even just as like a chicken substitute, they're delicious. Wow. <laughs> like even, even meat eaters would eat these, these uh, buffalo cauliflower and say that they're absolutely uh, uh, delicious. So um, yeah, so, but the garnish, I mean, vegetables on the side of a dish is basically a garnish that you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I would. I, I was just thinking that I would love to do a demonstration of the buffalo cauliflower or come into the Vista room because I'm sure we'll have them next semester. They're really, really good. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so here we go. Nice. All right, this is the second turning. You can see they're starting to get nice and a little dark and you can see these like little burnt spots on the side. That's why I wouldn't do this with the sill pot, sill pat pad, because that's gonna be really tricky to, uh, to get off. So again, I flip them. And this slow process of cooking is really good for chicken wings because as I mentioned, they're very small, but because they have so much connective tissue and 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 the the ligaments and tendons, they really take a, a, a like um think of like a short rib or a um uh, a brisket or a, a type of meat that has a lot of that cartilaginous stuff. It doesn't cook in the same way that like if we had a, a boneless, skinless chicken breast, we could throw it on a grill and it would be done in seven or eight minutes. But this lower temperature and the slower cooking time is helping to break down the collagen and give you that nice gelatinous taste that we like the kind of the reason we like chicken wings. So that's the second flip. I'm gonna pop them back in. I, uh, I once heard from another cooking show that, you know, we, to really think of time as an ingredient. Um, and so you need some, some things just, you, you can't rush. And this seems like one of those recipes that you're gonna be rewarded it's by taking it's the time. True. And, and I, I use that a lot in class, particularly when you see something like, like a quick bolognese or like an instant pho. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I mean, the whole magic of a bolognese sauce is that the meat cooks low and slow for like six or seven or eight hours. You can't make that fast. If you make that fast, it's just a meat sauce. Or same thing with like a pho, like how to make pho like really quickly. I'm like, no, that those bones have got to cook with the spices for five or six hours. Then you've got to cool it down. Then you've got to add in the meat and the tendons and stuff. They cool that down and the vegetables. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. How long do you put these back in? I do it 10 minutes, 10 minutes at a time every time I put them in. Um, and yes, actually, if, if we don't get you the cauliflower recipe, email me and I will... Um, I'll send you the cauliflower recipe. It's really, it's it's pretty excellent. The total cook time is about 35 to 40 minutes. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be two or three flips, depends on the um 
the size of the chicken wing. Like if you buy um, like some big, I got some chicken wings at Lunardi's a couple weeks ago and they were almost the size of drumsticks. Uh, or if you get them at a, you know, like a grocery store there, they're, they'll be done in about 30, 35 minutes or so um, at three, at 325. All right, so the last thing I wanna show you while everything is cooking is I'm going to show you what we're gonna do with our strawberries. So these strawberries are washed and we're getting into really, really good strawberry season. Um, and again, before anybody asks the question, um, is it okay to use the same sauce that the raw chicken marinade in? It is that we're cooking with, but afterwards I have some sauce in the fridge that has never touched the chicken. So I have some, when I made the sauce, I put some to the side that is gonna be served with it. The other stuff is the stuff that I'm that I'm basting and cooking with. Um, but it's we're coming into really nice strawberry season. This does not have to be done with strawberries. If you don't like strawberries, you could use any fruit you wanted. You could use blueberries, raspberries, uh, uh, a combination. Um, this is delicious. This is delicious with like peaches. Like you could uh, like marinate some peaches, maybe even with a little bit of of rum. Um, you could do this with rhubarb if you wanted to do some strawberry rhubarb. It's a, it's again the the the, the strawberries are a they're they're almost a garnish in the dish. Um, and but any fruit that you um, that you like with cream and with a biscuit is is delicious. So what I'm going to do with them though is I've given them a wash. Yeah, what I don't like them. That one's a little too red. I mean a little too white. Uh, my mother-in-law lives in Manteca and she comes over in the summer. See how nice and red those are as opposed to this one, which is like pretty white. Um, we're getting to that season where you get strawberries that are like red all the way through. Um, and they're just pretty awesome. So all I'm doing is cutting them into slices. You could cut them into quarters or chunks, whatever you want. But what I've done is I've taken, let me get a spoon. Hey, hey Tim, I was noticing your your slice, your cutting technique. Can you just show that again very quickly? You had very nice cutting technique there. People might want to hear a little bit I about just, that. Yeah, I have it like that. And I'm just, I'm cutting into, into slices. And your kind of fingers curled back and fingers. Um, yeah, that's that's something that we do a lot in the kitchen. You keep your fingers curled back. If your fingers are like that, that's when you're going to cut your fingers. When they're curved back, I'm actually keeping my knuckle is sort of the guard from keeping it away from the tips of my fingers. So every great. time I cook, I'm hitting the knuckle. So I'm not actually going to slice my fingers and then would have two injured people <laughs> in the family <laughs> right. from our jobs. So what I've done though, is I took some of these strawberries and I sprinkled them with a little bit of sugar, just a pinch of sugar, it wasn't measured. And you can see how just from this, I did this maybe an hour ago, you're, it's, it's pulling out some of the liquid, which is going to give it a much more pronounced flavor. Not so much sugar that it, it's sweet, but sugar is hydrophilic. It, 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 it absorbs water and pulls water. And what this does is you see how some of these strawberries are very, very white once they've been macerating in sugar. And macerate is kind of the, um, it's sort of the dry version of marinate. Uh, so when you marinate something, you marinate it in a liquid. When you macerate, you macerate something in a solid. And in this case, it's sugar. And the sugar is pulling out the juices from the strawberry and it gives it, it, it just intensifies the flavor um, immeasurably. I am, I'm sure you can measure it, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it makes it much more uh, significantly um, uh, strawberry-like. So that is that. So I was asking, can you use powdered sugar instead of granulated sugar? No. Um, what powdered sugar is, is sugar with a little bit of, um, uh, yeah, knife cuts running blood and <laughs> strawberries are indiscernible. That is true. Um, powdered sugar is a combination of very finely granulated sugar and some cornstarch. So powdered sugar is good in that it's, um, uh, it, it helps thicken things because it's got the, the cornstarch. It's good. I'm actually going to sprinkle a little bit on top of mine. If you put just raw powdered sugar into here, that cornstarch is going to make it gummy. Um, 
because cornstarch is it's a starch. So uh, uh, you could use brown sugar or white sugar or or uh, what's called baker sugar, which is just a very finely ground sugar. But by adding um, by adding powdered sugar, you're adding in that cornstarch, which you don't really want because it'll it'll make it it'll make it kind of tacky and gummy. Uh, I have never worked with monk fruit, so I don't know. Um, erythritol would give sweetness, but it wouldn't pull out the liquid the way that you want here. So it would kind of accentuate the flavor, um, but I'd be really, really, I'd use a very small amount because I know erythritol can be very, 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 very sweet. I honestly, I have never worked with monk fruit uh, uh, as a sweetener. I probably should, um, but I, I never have. Um, because you're a diabetic family. Yeah, honestly, if if if, if di diabetes is, is an issue, you maybe don't want to be eating strawberries anyways. In that case, what I would do is just either use the strawberries straight without adding the sugar, or even use a better berry like um like a blueberry, which is less, it's less sugary than a than a strawberry, um, or even like a, a blackberry, some one of the one of the tartar berries rather than the sweeter berries. Uh, uh, but I'm not a doctor. So again, that's that's uh, but that my immediate thought would be if you're if, if if sugar is an issue, use a use a fruit that has less sugar in it to begin with, and and blueberries tend to be less sweet than um than strawberries. So, okay, how much time do we have? Okay, we're coming to a close. So. I'm going to pull a Martha Stewart here uh, because I, I work for her, so I can say that. Um, the trick of doing this demo, and it was a, a something I've been thinking about for a while, the chicken wings have been cooking at 325. The shortcakes need to cook at 400. So I cooked off some shortcakes ahead of time using the other half of the recipe. So imagine I'm pulling these out of the oven. Um, and these are how the these are how the biscuits come out when they've been cooked. Oh, so they get gorgeous. a nice, beautiful color. They're not they're not like the perfectly rounded uh, uh, biscuits, but they've got this nice kind of rustic texture. And don't worry, I will bake those other ones out after I turn the oven up. But what I want to do with this is take the wrong knife. I wanted to grab the, you see how it's nice? See the nice light crumb and the texture in there? That's going to be really, really nice. Uh, again, that would look more like a bread or a cake if I had, if we had worked up that gluten more than we wanted to. But what I will do so I'll take a little bit of my, uh, my, my half of that. These strawberries smell so good. Um, people, uh, Dinky wants to know, how do you know that the biscuit is done before pulling it out of the oven? It's mostly by the color. Um, you can touch it. Uh, you can also take a toothpick and stick a toothpick in it. Um, they cook relatively fast because they were small and it was a, you know, it was a 400 degree oven. I think these were in for 12 minutes. Um, so, when you get used to it, you can touch it and you'll feel that it's not squishy. A better way is to take a toothpick and stick it in. And if it comes out dry, you're good. But then the best thing of all is if it if it's even close to done and you pull it out and you let it sit for half an hour before you use it, if there's any residual... Hold that thought. I think those look good. I'm going to call them done. Um, I'll get to those in a second. Um, uh, as they sit, you don't want to use them right out of the oven. As they sit, they're going to um, they're going to set. And you can see how like really nicely that that crumb is. So what I've got is I've got my biscuit. I've got my strawberries. I whipped up some cream, and because there's sugar in the biscuit and there's sugar on the strawberry, this is just cream that has been ripped, whipped. There's no sugar in it. You could, of course, put sugar in it if you wanted. You could put in some vanilla. You could put in some lemon zest. That is entirely up to you, but I, uh, my personal palate, with the strawberries being as sweet as they are, I don't need extra sugar in the whipped cream. And then because we got asked about Boom, 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 boom. The powdered sugar, that's a little powdered sugar on the top. 
So that is a, a biscuit, a drop biscuit shortcake with some strawberries and some whipped cream. Gorgeous. I think I can get rid of this. This might just be my dinner. I, I might not even eat the chicken wings. I might just have the, the strawberries. Speaking of the chicken, chicken wings, wings Tim, what? someone was asking about cooking the wings in an air fryer. Have you done that? Have that? Interesting. Um, Adam got me an air fryer for Christmas. We have not done chicken wings yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've done a lot of bacon. I thought that was its sole purpose. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and he, he bakes his taquitos in there. Um, I haven't tried them yet, uh, but I would like to try it. I would like to try it. I think, I think it would work fine. Um, it would obviously take a little bit less time because air fryers work very fast. Um, but again, I did see a recipe as I was looking up for this. Um, I did see a recipe that again, that also recommended like, you know, cook it halfway through, then flip it over. And if I were doing this, I would flip it over and again, brush it with a little bit more of the sauce. So uh, uh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad someone asked it and it's gonna remind me to put it on my uh, list of summer things to try in the uh, in the air fryer. <laughs> it's funny, I didn't ask for one. He just got one and was like, yeah, let's give it a try. See what we do. I fell in love with my Instapot when he got me an Instapot a couple of years ago. Would whole wheat flour for the biscuits make it savory? Um, that's sort of a matter of taste. I, I think whole wheat flour, whole wheat flour would probably be better if you're going to use this on a chicken and a biscuit or with sausage or something like that. It it I think it would be a very I don't think I would like it with the strawberries. If you like whole wheat and you like whole wheat, like a whole wheat toast with strawberry jam, if you like that flavor and texture, I say go for it and give it a try. Um let us know when you need taste testers. <laughs> awesome. We always need them in the Vista room. Um, but I would give that a try. I would think that whole wheat flour would have, because whole wheat flour can be 15, 16% gluten um, as opposed to all purpose, which is like 11. So I think you would get a denser, it, whether while, while the flavor might be good, I think you would have a denser biscuit than you would want for a, a preparation like this. But again, give it a, give it a try. That's, that's, that's a, that's a uh, just keep in mind more gluten, more different mouthfeel, um, but it might be good. You, you, you might you might be onto something there. Um, how do you know the wings are, are cooked all the way through? That's the fun part about being the chef is the only way you can kind of tell because they're so thin and they're so small, you can't really take a thermometer and stick them in there. So the only way to tell is to try the chef's portion. And that means, you know, you take two or three off the plate, you try them or you cut into them and you say, okay, they're cooked all the way through. Um, but that's it in 30 minutes in, they've been in there for 30, 35 minutes. Odds are they're probably going to be, unless they're super big or were frozen, they're probably going to be fine. Um, can we turn these biscuits into scones? Um, scones is a similar process, uh, but scones are rolled out and then cut. So, so yes, you could use this batter and this technique and add in some lemon zest or some pistachios or something and see if the scones come out, but you're gonna probably find that these biscuits are much, much, cause scones are, they're pretty dense. I love them to dip into coffee, but again, it's a, it's a different between the biscuits being really delicate and soft because of the no, the, the, like the, the limiting the gluten production as opposed to a scone, which is gonna be kneaded a little bit more and rolled out and manipulated a little bit more. So it has more of that, that scony texture. Um, if, if that makes, it's not an adjective, but it is now. Um, so, all right. So what I'm going to do is again, I have my little, I have my little side of celery just because celery is traditional with like, uh, 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 buffalo wings, the, the hot buffalo wings. And then I'm going to take a couple of my wings and I'm not going to be extra fancy here because they're wings. You can't be fancy with wings, but I have a couple flats. How many napkins do you serve with your wings there, Tim? <laughs> if I was at a restaurant, probably some. If I was just eating here at home, I'm just going to wipe it on my shirt. <laughs> Hold my finger out for my dogs to for my dog to lick. Um, so there we go. We've got a nice, again, focus on the technique rather than the recipe, but we've got a nice biscuit with some strawberries and cream, and we've got some sweet and sour. This technique would work if it was teriyaki, if it was a barbecue sauce, um, whatever you wanted, but have a little bit of sauce on the side, have some of your vegetable 
garnish and you're good to go. Well, that looks amazing. I think yes, we are. Really good. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> the one thing I wanted to mention, it is mentioned on the recipe. Um, you have to be careful when you are, there is pineapple in the marinade. Um, you can marinate something like a teriyaki, I would marinate overnight, or even like a hot sauce, I would marinate, uh, uh, marinate overnight. If you have pineapple in your marinade, it can only marinate for a couple hours because pineapple has a has an enzyme in it that starts to break down proteins. So if you had pineapple juice in the marinade and you let it marinate overnight, it's gonna be really kind of uh, uh, gummy. So the best thing to do is marinate it in the sweet and sour and then add the pineapple maybe half an hour before you, um, before you throw it into the oven. Okay. Can I show the finished projects? Absolutely. Uh, someone was asking if you, how would you cook the wings if you use a dry rub as opposed to a sauce? Is that with a good application rub, then for? It's, then, it's, then it's simpler because with the dry rub, again, I would let it sit and, and sit overnight. Then it's just a matter of popping them in the oven or throwing them on the grill and cooking them till they're done. The whole flipping part is a matter of turning the sauce into a part of the, of the dish. So with a dry rub, it's almost, it's almost easier to cook because you've got the dry rub on there and you just put it down, you cook it on one side, cook it on the other side, and then it's done. The technique that I showed is about building up those layers of flavor as the sauce caramelizes, then you add more sauce, you caramelize that sauce, you add more sauce, you caramelize that sauce. So it's, 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 it's a simpler technique. And then you just dry rub it, throw it in the oven, throw it on the grill, you're, you're good to go. The pineapple. I made that mistake with shrimp once too. And unfortunately it was with the catered party. Uh, I had oh, no. like 60, I had like 60 straw, uh, shrimp pineapple skewers that we had, and this was 30 years ago when I was just starting, they had sat in the refrigerator overnight and we took them out to grill them the next day. And we were like, oh my God, what happened to the shrimp? And then I'm like, oh, pineapple has an enzyme in it. Oh no. <laughs> well, my, Tim, hey. thank you so much. And by the way, don't, don't think we, we missed that you mentioned that you worked for Martha Stewart. So we're, that <laughs> sounds like a story and a it was, whole it was other two class. Weeks. It was only for two weeks. A girlfriend of mine was an editor for her and she was out on maternity leave. So I was, I consulted for two weeks and, uh, uh, but she was very fun. Oh, I have many names I could drop, <laughs> including <laughs> former presidents. <laughs> well, that, I mean, as if we didn't want to have you back soon, that's a whole other. <laughs> well, now we have to do the cauliflower. Now we have to do right? the, the, the hot cauliflower. <laughs> a cauliflower and a whole air fryer. <laughs> and a, I'm going to have to work on the air fryer um, and, and, and see what I can come up with. But we've made some good stuff in there. Right. Um, how far we do these? Oh, I don't know. We do this maybe maybe twice a year. We do events like these. Yeah, we've done this. We've had some. We have some other um, uh, chefs from campus who've done them yeah. as well. And so we we put on a few of these a year. But um, always well received, and we're always so excited to see you. And they're always fun. It's 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 it's. I love I love teaching, and it's always fun to get a a different eyes. It's, 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 of course, it's more fun to be in person and get to share this all together. But I'm going to enjoy this and save some for. For Adam, maybe for breakfast. He sounds like he's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I was going to say, you know, we send um, our healing thoughts to your well, husband. You. And as we note, we noted earlier, luckily he only needs one hand to be able to. Exactly. But wings, I'm, I'm so going to I'm gonna have to tell him that like the whole thing fell apart because he wasn't here as my cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> so we in good shape. In good shape. And you know what? We'll let everyone know. Um, we'll make sure that we announce the Vista Hour rooms when you reopen in the fall after Great. the uh, summer. Um, awesome. if, people haven't been to the Vista room. If you live nearby, come for lunch. It's fantastic. It's lunch. one of it's our favorite things to and do. And the students, the students really do most of the cooking. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. All right. Now, well, thank you. Cool. I um, love doing this stuff. Good to see you. A really wonderful summer. Thank you to everybody who joined us um, from near and far. I saw that there were people from Austin, Texas and Oregon and um, a lot here in California, but a lot of others. And this is one of those um, things that was, you know, that that came out of our couple of years in lockdown as we started doing these online and they've been a huge success and allow us to reach out to a lot of people. So thank you for joining us, Tim. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, I'm gonna 
they taste now have really to go good. home and heat up my frozen <laughs> meal in my microwave after seeing this. But I'm going to try that recipe next time I have people over. So good right. night, everyone. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you all again very, very soon. Have a great night. Thank you.